Okay, hi everyone. So I'm here to do a Q&A about science and technology for kids and others. And uh, our main topic last couple of weeks, which we're gonna continue this week, is kind of questions about things from science fiction that might or might not become real. And I noticed we have a few questions left over um, from um, last week. And I could perhaps um, uh, start with some of those. So the first one I'm seeing here, are how far away are we from a new propulsion system that could take us to another galaxy? Well, I'm afraid we're a long way away. First thing to know is, if you want to get a spacecraft into orbit around the Earth, you need to have it go at 17,000 miles an hour. If you want it to escape from the gravity of the Earth, you need to have it go at 25,000 miles an hour. If you want it to escape from the gravity of the Sun, so that it's able to leave the whole solar system, it has to go at 100,000 miles an hour. And if you want it to escape the gravity of our galaxy, it has to go at a million miles an hour. So you have to be able to get your spacecraft to go really fast. Um, and uh, the question is, how on earth would you do that? And the, um, the current approach to making spacecraft is basically you've, you're, you're burning a fuel, and when you burn the fuel, it uh, gets hot, and the, the gas that is, that is produced is going very quickly, and the gas goes out in one direction. And because when you push something, when you, if, you, if you throw a ball, there'll be a slight reaction that will push you back. And in, in general, when you push something out with lots of momentum in one direction, you, in order to conserve momentum, you get pushed in the other direction. And that's, that's basically the idea of rockets. Um, is you've got to have something in the rocket that can be pushed out that um, will, um, uh, will make the rocket go forwards. And the most common way to do that, the way that most rockets work, is using chemical reactions and essentially burning, they might burn uh, hydrogen in oxygen. So that, uh, that, that um, it's a reaction which is, is, releases a lot of energy. Um, and that's how the rocket is propelled forward. Now, there are a few other ideas for how to do things. I think I mentioned in some other of these, um, uh, these live streams, like ion propulsion, where instead of, uh, instead of having um, uh, a gas be pushed out, you're, um, uh, you're pushing out um, uh, ions or even electrons um, using electrical processes from your spacecraft. But that's only used to make very tiny it's only so far been used to make very, very tiny kind of pushes to the spacecraft, not, um, uh, not the kind of thing that you need to like make the spacecraft go at a million miles an hour. There are other schemes that involve uh, having a spacecraft, um, a very tiny spacecraft using a, a big solar sail type thing and using the pressure that you get from uh, an intense beam of light to push the spacecraft forward, where there, in that case, you might have a big laser on the Earth that's trying to push the spacecraft away from the Earth um, by having the, the energy that you need to run the laser be something that's on Earth, but then you get to push the spacecraft away. But that's not going to work. By the time the spacecraft is on the other side of the galaxy, you're really out of luck in terms of that. OK, so what other possibilities are there? Well, uh, you need something which is going to release a lot of energy to make the spacecraft go forwards. And maybe it's something that you keep on the spacecraft, but then it's going to be hard to do that because if you want to keep the spacecraft accelerating, going faster and faster and faster, you're, you're probably gonna run out of fuel quite quickly. And, and most rockets, you know, when spacecraft are going to the moon or something, they are burning their rocket engines only for a matter of, I think, at most a few minutes and, and intensely pushing themselves to go faster and faster. Once, once they're going at a certain speed, the uh, Newton's laws of motion, for example, say, uh, something which is not acted on by any force just keeps going at the same speed in a particular direction um, until it's acted on by some force. So if you are if you're a spacecraft and you manage to escape the gravity of the Earth and you're just pointed in some direction and you're going with some speed, you just keep going in that direction until some other force, like a force of gravity from some other planet or something, acts on you. So so that's some um, okay. So what else could you possibly do? So here's, here's, another, here's another thing you could do, an alternative to like keeping, so, so one question is, can you keep the fuel on the spacecraft 
and have it go faster and faster and faster. That's tough because, you know, if you put a lot of fuel on the spacecraft, the spacecraft itself is going to be very heavy. And that means it's harder to make it go faster. So, okay, so here's another trick which has been used by spacecraft in the solar system, which is a, a gravitational slingshot trick. So the idea is you're a spacecraft and you are approaching some planet and you basically get pulled in by the gravity of the planet. And as you get pulled in, for example, by the gravity of Jupiter, you'll go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So for example, for the Earth, I don't know what it is for Jupiter. I, I have to try and work it out. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a guess. It might be 60,000 miles an hour, but I'm not sure. We can, we can go, um, Wolf Alpha can certainly tell us the answer to this, what the escape velocity of Jupiter is. But, but basically, if you are, let's say it's 60,000 miles an hour, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna compute this. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I want to actually give you, um, give you the, the true answer, Jupiter escape velocity. I'm just typing it into Wolf Alpha. You could probably ask um, Siri, which will go ask Wolf Alpha. Okay, oh, I was wrong. The escape velocity of Jupiter is 134,000 miles an hour. Okay, so if a spacecraft is approaching Jupiter and was just gonna go from, from being at rest somewhere and it was gonna go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and eventually was gonna hit the surface of Jupiter, whatever that means, well, we can talk about what that means because Jupiter is a gas planet and so it doesn't really have a solid surface. But let's say until you get to the point where you hit the upper level of clouds on Jupiter, if you go from, from just being at rest, just falling, falling, falling towards Jupiter, you, um, uh, uh, you will fall, eventually you will be going at 134,000 miles an hour when you hit the, um, the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. Okay, so let's imagine that you're, you've got the spacecraft and it's falling towards Jupiter and it's going faster and faster and faster just because of the gravity of Jupiter, it's pulling it, making it accelerate. Okay, but now let's say that instead of actually hitting Jupiter, you arrange for the spacecraft to just go to not, to slightly miss Jupiter, to go around the side. Um, then what you find happens is that you will be successfully going at 134,000 miles an hour or almost as you, uh, as you go, you know, because you would be about to hit Jupiter, but actually you, you miss it. And then what happens is that you get pulled around in, in sort of half an orbit around Jupiter, if you arrange it correctly, and you're still going at that speed, and then you go off in some other direction. Um, actually, actually, you can keep going. I have to think about this. I think you can keep going in more or less the same direction, but you've been accelerated by, by the gravity of Jupiter. So no, actually, what, what I said isn't quite right. What, what, what you want to do is, is you approach Jupiter and you just glance off the side of it and then keep going in that same direction. That's, that, that's the better way to do it. Um, and then, so you're using the gravity of Jupiter to speed you up. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know what the good analogy is, but, but um, uh, so that's one way to make a spacecraft go faster is you know, find your friendly planet and uh, almost hit it, but just arrange to not hit it and use its gravity to make you go faster. So that would be another approach. Another thing you can do is say, well, you know, let's not keep the spacecraft, let's not keep the fuel on the spacecraft. Let's collect the fuel from, uh, just sort of forage the fuel from, from uh, what's out there in space. Well, the problem is there isn't a lot in space. There's about one hydrogen atom per cubic meter in space, roughly, in interstellar space. And actually, when you're going really, really fast, that, you know, having a hydrogen atom hit you is actually not a great thing. But let's imagine you could have some big collector that would sort of uh, vacuum up all of these hydrogen atoms and you could use that as a piece as fuel for your spacecraft. And that way you might have some way to avoid having to keep the fuel for the spacecraft on the spacecraft. So what other schemes are there? Well, there are some other much more exotic schemes. Um, actually, there's some physics that I did a long time ago that was used by science fiction folk to um, invent a kind of at least a conceptual idea for how to make uh, interstellar propulsion system based on so-called zero point energy of the vacuum. Um, I don't think the scheme that they proposed would work, but uh, it is certainly conceivable with this theory of physics that we have now that something like that could work, although I don't know how to make it work. But so the idea is this. So in the vacuum, you might think there's absolutely nothing there in the vacuum. There's no matter, there's no particles, there's no nothing. It's just vacuum empty space. Turns out that's not a correct view of what's happening in physics. Instead, the space is kind of has to be made out of some sort of atoms of space. They're not like atoms of matter. They're like these points that get knitted together to make space, to make this thing that has sort of, uh, that, that we can move through and, and exist in and so on. And that process of kind of creating space 
is something where at a very, very, very tiny scale, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of times smaller than, than, uh, than an atom, for example, um, there, are, there are processes going on that are very, uh, lo lots of activity there. So that activity actually creates um, essentially energy that uh, exists throughout space, throughout, even when there's a vacuum, there's some energy that's associated with that vacuum. Now we don't notice that there's energy there because the energy is everywhere. So we only notice when we add energy to the vacuum and we, we do things which, which add, uh, where, when it's just vacuum, it's like, well, that's the same as it always is. We don't notice that it's there. So one possibility would be if there was a way to uh, sort of uh, arrange to have some of that activity that exists in the vacuum not occur in a particular place in space. I, somewhat amusingly, I was referring to this recently as a vacuum cleaner so to speak, something which will take the, all the activity that's in the vacuum of space and sort of not have it happen in some region of vacuum. We don't know how to make that happen. We don't know how to achieve that. We don't know how to sort of make a box that will have walls that are sort of impenetrable enough that even this process that sort of knits together the structure of space can't penetrate the box. We don't know how to do that. But if we could do that, we would have this huge energy imbalance because there'd be all this stuff outside the box that's all this activity that's making space, but inside the box, there'd be less activity. So there'd be sort of a huge difference in energy between what's outside and what's inside. And that difference would almost certainly let one create uh, kind of, um, let one create some sort of engine that's like a rocket or something that would do things. But we don't know how to create that kind of vacuum cleaner-like thing. So, you know, there are other, other schemes like this, but I think, um, well, okay, so, so another possibility, okay, there's an interesting one, I haven't thought about this before, is, you know, I mentioned this idea of this sort of slingshotty thing around Jupiter, what if you have a black hole? So a black hole has the feature, the black hole is like a collapsed star, and for example, the center of our galaxy, there's a very big black hole, it's like 10,000, you know, that, that sort of uh, 10,000 stars collapsed into it. And um, a black hole is something where the escape velocity, where there's so much gravity that the escape velocity is the speed of light. And that means because nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that means nothing can escape from the black hole. And that's why it's black, because it, nothing, nothing is, uh, is, is, is the, any light that comes through is just absorbed by the black hole. It never gets, never gets transmitted back to, to, to sort of show up as, as, as light. So... The idea would be, given that the escape velocity of the black hole is the speed of light, you can, um, you can imagine that the same effect that I was mentioning with Jupiter, you could, you could be pulled in towards the black hole, but you could just avoid the black hole, and you could use that as a way to kind of uh, accelerate to, um, uh, to approach the, um, uh, to, to escape the galaxy. Actually, that's not a terrible idea. It might actually work. So let me tell you what I, what I do know about that. So black holes have a, have a lot of gravity. They have so much gravity that they're actually pretty good at, um, okay, so here's an extreme thing that can happen with a certain kind of black hole. A photon can go into, a photon of light can go into orbit around a black hole. So normally you think light is just going in straight lines, whatever, it's, it's um, you know, you, you don't imagine that there's a possibility that light could be so pulled by gravity that it actually can go into orbit around, um, uh, uh, around a black hole, but that can happen. And actually, about a month ago, um, some uh, some people I know actually announced sort of an observation of um, uh, of something which seems like it's it's like photons going into orbit around a black hole. Um, so that's a that's sort of a, a type of thing that you can do. But but I think this idea of using the gravity of a black hole to um, to accelerate you to go really fast is is might might. Might actually work. You have to compute it. It's it's um, uh, gosh, I could I, um, by going super much more technical, I could actually start to think about how you would compute that. I I think um, uh, it reminds me there's a strange phenomenon called gravitational lensing. So how does a how does a lens, um, what does a lens do when you when you have light? You look through a lens, look through a magnifying glass, something like that. What's what's happening to the light? Well, what's happening is the rays of light from something might all be parallel, but then the lens, if it's, a, if it's a lens that's a bulging out lens, a convex lens, then what it does is 
it will uh, concentrate the light. So the rays of light will be coming in parallel, but then they'll be made to converge and that the light rays will eventually converge at a point. And that's why, for example, if you take a magnifying glass and like where I am right now today, it's uh, the sun is out and it's, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, this, uh, it, it's, uh, the, it's uh, you, you know, you can, so if you, t if I took a magnifying glass outside and um, I took it and uh, I, you know, have, let's say a black piece of paper or something which absorbs lots of light, but it would even work with a white piece of paper, they're not as quickly. And I, I concentrate the light from the sun in a point. I can use the magnifying glass, which is a convex lens to concentrate the light from the sun in a point on a piece of paper, I can burn that piece of paper. I don't necessarily recommend the experiment, but um, and if you do that, make sure you you don't don't look at the spot of light. It's really bright and it'll hurt your eyes. Um, but uh, but what's happening there is that the the uh, the light from the sun, the sort of rays of light from the sun, are coming in parallel. Um, they they go through the 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 um, the lens, and then they're made to converge together and get focused at a point. Um, and that's what a typical lens does. Okay, so here's a weird effect. Imagine you have a, a star, a black hole, and um, it, it is capable of taking uh, you know, a photon of light, and as the photon goes near the black hole or near the, the high gravitational, uh, uh, high mass object, the, um, uh, the photon will be turned, and in fact, photons on the two sides will be, will be focused together. And so that, that phenomenon is called gravitational lensing, and it's actually a phenomenon that's been observed um, in the universe, and that's a that's an example of something that happens in um, uh, in um, uh, in actual, um, and, and it, it can uh, it causes one to, for example, if you if you kind of trace where the rays go, it means that there can be if there's a galaxy and it's behind this like black hole or something, then you might actually see two images of that galaxy because the light will go in two different directions around the black hole and then will be will be turned so that it. Um, uh, um, so that it, so that both those images um, reach us on Earth. So, so I guess my my answer is that, okay. There's a there's a possible idea which requires a bit more bit more work to understand. Is if you get your spacecraft all the way to some your your local neighborhood black hole, we don't actually know where the nearest black hole is. I think what is the guess? Well, the nearest star other than the sun is four light years away. Um, I would suspect that there aren't any black holes within 100 light years of where we are, but I'm not certain of that, and I'm not sure if it's actually known. Um, I think that the, uh, it's kind of hard to detect. You can use gravitational lensing, for example, to defect, detect the presence of a black hole. Uh, if the black hole is, is uh, stars only form black holes when they're a, a bit heavier than the sun, um, like one and a half times heavier than the sun. Um, so unless black holes come from some origin other than a collapsing star, um, they have to be quite large. Um, and I, I, I guess we don't know. I think by the time we're a thousand light years away, I think there are known black holes. I'm not sure. I can look up. There's one black hole that's um, a famous one that's uh, um, a, a, a star called Cygnus X1, which is, um, uh, was the first kind of star that was um, um, uh, distance from Earth. Oh, boy. Okay, much further than I thought. It's 5,600 light years away from Earth. So that's, the, um, that's a star that actually, uh, um, around the black hole, things are being pulled in so quickly by the black hole that it's actually not producing X-rays um, instead of visible light uh, as a result of processes that happen near the black hole. So anyway, the, the, that's at least one thought for how we get out of the galaxy. But I mean, hopefully there's a, uh, in order to make that work, you have to kind of, you know, you have to solve the problem of getting to the near, nearest star other than the sun, and that's already a very hard problem. Okay. Um, let's see. Gosh, there are a lot of interesting questions here. All right, let me, let me look at some of the new ones that have come in here. Um, okay, there's a question from Brian here. What about a rail gun in space that launches rockets? Yeah, actually, there are people who are trying to do things like that. So a rail gun works by using electromagnetism to, um, so, so if you have um, uh, a magnetic field, um, well, you have a magnet, you can use magnets to pull other things. And in a rail gun, you're using kind of a, a, a certain kind of magnet to, uh, to just accelerate things so that they go very fast. And so the idea of a rail gun is you might make something go, um, uh, you know, the, the, the notion is uh, 
that, for example, you might use it as a gun, as the name railgun suggests, and it might make something like a, a big shell or something go at, uh, let's say, 2,000 miles an hour. Pretty fast. You can make railguns that make things go faster than bullets from, from guns that are, that, are, that are powered by sort of chemical processes, the same kind of processes that power rockets. So railguns uh, are a way of, of shooting something out really fast. So there's actually a, um, uh, people have thought about using railguns to launch satellites into orbit. Um, and in fact, there's a company uh, that has been doing tests on something much more exotic than that. Their idea is, I think it's called, what is it called? I forget its name. But anyway, their idea is that you literally are twirling something around really, really fast. And you know, when you, you have something on a string, for example, and you've got a weight at the end of a string and you twirl it around, the, the, the weight is pulling away from you. It's, uh, you know, it's often called centrifugal force, and people make a big fuss about the fact that there isn't really a centrifugal force, it's just the centripetal force of you pulling the weight to prevent it from escaping. But, but for all practical purposes, there is the analog of a force that is pulling that weight out um, as you twirl it around. Okay, so the idea of these guys is to twirl things around fast enough that um, if you just let the thing escape at just the right moment, it'll be going fast enough, it'll, be, it'll have enough outward force that you can launch it into orbit. And it's kind of remarkable that something like that could work. I mean, that you could have something twirling around and you make it go faster, 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 and then at just the right moment, you open this little door and you let the thing come out and go into orbit. So they claim, uh, I saw these guys so six months ago or something, they claimed they were not far away from, from doing real tests of this. But that's sort of an idea for how to, um, uh, um, how to uh, make something go into orbit by just basically throwing it into orbit. I mean, usually a rocket, the rocket itself is pushing, you know, the thing to go faster and faster and faster. This, the idea is you have this giant sort of gun and you're basically shooting things into orbit. Now, the question which was asked here by Brian was, what about a railgun in space that launches rockets? Interesting. So, okay, a couple of points. So first of all, uh, if you have a thing that is, where which is launching a rocket in one direction that that's really a non-starter because you really have to have okay when you when you launch a rocket from the earth, let, let's say you have a rail gun and it's shooting a satellite into orbit from the earth there will be a slight recoil to the earth in other words when that satellite is pushed when the, all this momentum goes to push that satellite out into orbit it's going at seventeen thousand miles an hour it's going to go into orbit it's a satellite it weighs you know i don't know half a ton let's say You've got this, all this momentum in the satellite that was produced by this rail gun. Because of the conservation of momentum, or otherwise uh, Newton's third law, you can say it different ways, equal, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, say it in a bunch of different ways. But the basic result is that it's a fact of physics, um, which actually I can now explain from much more fundamental uh, uh, origins why that fact is true. But... Um, uh, in any case, it's a true fact that you, if you have, if you kind of create momentum, you push something out in one direction, you'll get a recoil in the other direction. Okay, here's how the math works. So momentum is, uh, uh, for these purposes, it's mass times velocity. So momentum of something is the mass of the thing times its velocity. And so when you say you're conserving momentum, you've got these two things, and it has to be the case that the momentum going one direction has to be the same as the momentum going in the other direction. If you have this rocket that, let's say, a satellite that weighs a ton and is going at 17,000 miles an hour, which is orbital speed for the Earth, um, then that will be a certain momentum. So we could work out, let me just work this out. Um, let me just uh, pull this to the right place here. Let's do the calculations. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, uh, let's say 17,000 miles per hour times one ton, and then we're going to say divided by mass of Earth. Okay, so what we're going to do here is that will work out, uh, we're going to say the rocket going in one direction, um, and oh my gosh, that's amusing. Um, okay, so the, the, the rocket is going in one direction, it weighs a ton, it's going at 17,000 miles an hour. It's being launched from the Earth. The Earth will recoil as a result of that launch. How much will the Earth recoil? Well, the momentum is the mass times the velocity. So that means the mass times the velocity for the satellite is one ton times 17,000 miles an hour. 
the momentum for the Earth is the mass of the Earth times whatever velocity it recoils with. So we can you know, take the equation, we can work that out. So I just computed uh, escape velocity of Earth times one ton divided by mass of the Earth. Okay, so that's telling me what the recoil speed of the Earth is from that, from shooting the satellite out from the rail gun. The answer is, uh, well, I'll say it in science notation, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 18 miles per hour. So that means it is a, a, um, uh, a million trillionth of a mile per hour. So in other words, the Earth, because the Earth is so heavy, the recoil from the, on the Earth associated with launching that one ton satellite at that high speed is absolutely tiny. Never notice it. It's a, 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 a million trillionth of a mile per hour that the Earth would recoil as a result of launching that satellite. Okay. The problem is, if you put a rail gun in space, you don't have all of the mass, you know, unless you put that rail gun on a great big asteroid or something, um, that mail, rail gun, if it's just floating in space and it launches the satellite out at some, you know, let's say it launches it at 100,000 miles an hour, then the rail gun depending on how much heavier the rail gun is than the, than the satellite, the rail gun will recoil with a comparable speed. And, and uh, the, um, uh, actually, what, why was that cause a problem? That, um, um, let's see. No, you can still get, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this wrong. You can, by, by having, the recoil is not that important because you can still have, um, it's like an explosion in, in space. The fact that the total momentum of the explosion is zero uh, doesn't mean that you can't have things going in the two directions really fast. So, okay, so I'm, I'm taking this back and I'm saying um, if you could get, uh, so I'm, I'm ignore my recoil stuff. The, um, the, the fact is if you just had this rail gun in space and it was launching something in one direction, the, the rail gun would recoil in the other direction. Okay, it wouldn't stay in one place, but you might nevertheless be able to launch something out in that direction. Okay, what will be a problem with this? Well, one problem is how do you power the rail gun? Where does it get its energy from? You know, it's got to be storing. Um, so one thing you could do is you could have the rail gun have a, a giant solar cell. So it's collecting energy from, from the sun, for example, storing it up and then storing it in some big capacitor that stores electricity. And, um, uh, and then boom, it, it launches the thing out from the rail gun. So actually that's not a terrible idea. That's, that's some, um, might work. I don't know. You know, you have to figure out how much energy you can store, how much electricity you could store uh, in a battery or a capacitor that you've collected from the sun. And then what you would do is probably you would collect the the um, the energy from uh, from uh, from uh, you know turn it from from um, light into electricity, uh, collect it for a month, let's say, and then say, okay, we're going to use all of the stuff, all the energy we collected. We're going to use it to power this rail gun to shoot this thing out really fast. So that's an interesting idea. I, I have not heard that idea as a as a kind of a, um, a, a concept for how to make. Um, uh, maybe there's some problem with it, but I it um, seems like a good idea. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, um, Oh, there's a few other suggestions on the live stream about, about how to um, power spacecraft. So another one is micronuclear explosions from Luis. Um, yes, that was one that was thought about in the early 1960s, actually, is to have, um, is to use, because um, uh, nuclear power releases a lot more energy. When, when you have a, a chemical reaction, like you are burning hydrogen and oxygen, um, that releases a certain amount of energy. But that's only energy associated with the reforming of chemical bonds. And that energy is, is very small compared to the energy associated with nuclear bonds, with, with breaking up nuclei and things like that. So you can, uh, and that's why nuclear reactors, uh, nuclear explosions can be quite powerful. So yes, that is actually something that was thought about um, early 1960s. Um, basically what happened is there was an idea to have a spacecraft that would be powered by tiny nuclear explosions the, the big downer of having nuclear explosions in space is nuclear explosions produce these electromagnetic pulses, which essentially destroy satellites um, because they basically induce voltages in the electronics in satellites that um, uh, uh, will fry that, that, that electronics unless it's very well protected. That's one problem. The other problem was that the world decided to have uh, a, a nuclear test ban so that, that um, uh, said, Initially, you couldn't do tests in the atmosphere, and later on, you couldn't do tests even underground of nuclear weapons. 
and most countries in the world, with the exception of countries like North Korea, uh, follow that that treaty um, that says that you can't um, you can't uh, uh, detonate nuclear explosions. But in particular, uh, sort of an early thing was you can't detonate nuclear explosions in the atmosphere or in space. Um, so that was kind of the um, uh, that that was that was why people abandoned that idea um, for um, uh, for doing it. But but actually, that's a I don't know how how successfully there was a thing called Project Orion that was a, a an effort to um, uh, to imagine a, a nuclear powered spacecraft. I actually don't know the details of what's involved in that. I think you know one of the issues is uh, you know nuclear explosions are pretty violent, and um, you know in a in a you have to have sort of it's no good if you if the nuclear explosion destroys your spacecraft as well as you know making your spacecraft go faster. And I don't I don't know how you avoid that. I'm sure that was that was thought about. Um, and I, you know, the problem is a nuclear explosion is um, because of this notion of critical mass that is what leads to the possibility of nuclear explosions. I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that you can have a, um, let's think, I, I, I don't think you can have a really tiny nuclear explosion. I think it has to be, it has to have a certain minimum size. Um, and oh gosh, there are lots and lots of questions here. Um, uh, Let's see. Um, uh, gosh, well, there was a, a, a recent question here from um, Fraxel. Is it possible, wait a minute, no, from Anders. Does the sun emit electromagnetic pulses? And if so, how are satellites protected? Yes, the sun, there are solar flares. And solar flares, um, well, solar flares, the main problem with solar flares is that the, from the sun, you know, most of what the sun produces is light. But the sun also produces a stream of electrons and other kinds of particles and protons actually that stream towards the earth and, and out from the sun. And they make the, at least the lower energy part of cosmic rays. And the earth is protected from, from most of those things by its magnetosphere. That's kind of a magnetic sheath around the earth that, um, that makes those particles, that deflects those particles. But um, when you get, um, uh, when, when there's a violent enough solar flare, you have a big burst of, um, uh, of, those, of those particles, and that can, in fact, damage satellites. Now, there's a, you can look up, um, in fact, we have it in Wolfram Alpha, the space weather forecast. So let's see what the space weather is today. Space weather is all about um, the, amount of, uh, uh, the amount that's coming from the sun. So let's see. Uh, gosh, I don't really know how to read this. Um, the... Uh, uh, okay, the, the planetary KP index is two, four hours ago, and it seems like it has been bouncing up and down between zero and two recently, but I think, let's see, the, um, uh, the density of the solar wind is 3.4 particles per cubic centimeter right now. So that means that the particles streaming out from the sun, if we were to look, that's a very small number of particles. So in every, in every cubic centimeter, Okay. There are 3.4 particles that are coming from the sun into, in space, um, and the effective temperature is 60,000 degrees centigrade, apparently. Um, and, and usually, the, the, um, and the, there, are these, there are these flares where that density will become much larger. Um, now, the other thing that happens is that the, um, uh, the amount of, of, of that activity is also related to sunspots. So on, on the surface of the sun, there are essentially these giant magnetic storms on the surface of the sun that are sunspots. And uh, if you look at the, um, uh, so the number of sunspots varies in, there's a roughly 11 year, I think it's 11 year cycle um, in sunspot activity, which I don't think anybody understands. So for example, right now, I'm looking at this, um, uh, this result. Right now, there are no sunspots visible on the surface of the sun, but like, um, in 2000, I'm looking at this plot, there were 150 sunspots visible on the surface of the sun. And so it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. There's a very strange thing. Back in the 1650s, there was this long period of time, between 1650 and 1700, there was this long period of time when there were very few sunspots visible. And that also coincided with a time when the temperature of the surface of the earth was colder. And uh, nobody really understands that. It's called the Maunder Minimum. Um, nobody really understands that phenomenon. Um, and the, the, the fact, it's possible that the amount of heat output by the sun is actually related to these things like sunspot uh, densities. 
but that's a so what what can happen with satellites is there are there are solar flares they happen from time to time there was one that happened oh gosh when was it it was some um, who uh when was that about 25 years ago maybe um there was a solar flare that knocked out some satellites um and uh caused caused various kinds of problems and i don't know i think i think nowadays that satellites tend to try to be protected from those kinds of things. Um, but anyway, you can look at, there's a, you know, there's a space weather um, which tells you, you know, how much, you know, what, what's happening with the solar wind, which is just this wind of particles, electrons uh, and protons, um, not a wind like on the earth where it's air and so on. It's a wind of particles coming from the sun um, and that, uh, that can happen there. Um, okay. Uh, Oh, there's a question here about light is made of light. How can light go around anything? Um, okay, so, so what happens is if you have a laser beam, for example, that laser beam, you can think of it as being made from huge numbers of, of photons, um, huge numbers of little particles of light. And those particles of light uh, are, and it's a, it's a strange thing, but it's just like, um, just like you have, um, uh, just like you drop something on Earth, the gravity of the Earth will pull the thing down. The same thing happens for photons. There's a tiny effect of the photons. If you, if you let that beam of light, I mean, the speed of light is so fast compared to the escape velocity of the Earth that you, know, you shoot your laser into space and the, the photons will just go off into space. The only thing that doesn't have that property is a black hole where its gravity is so, so strong that it will pull back even those photons from light. So what, what can happen is that gravity can have an effect on these photons. Now, most things don't have an effect on photons. For example, um, if you have a magnetic field, photons, they don't care. They just go straight through. Actually, there is a small effect, the polarization of photons, which has to do with the kind of, well, uh, is, is affected by magnetic fields. But they're, they're not, a photon, you've got a magnetic field, says, I don't care. The photon just goes straight through. A gravitational field, there will be a small pull from gravity on the photon that, um, uh, will make it um, will make it change its direction, and you know, on on Earth, um, we don't get to see that. Um, actually, there is a phenomenon called the gravitational redshift, which has been observed on the Earth with photons, where when you try and have a photon, the 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 um, uh, the, the energy of a photon, which turns into its its frequency and its and its color, effectively, is light. If you uh, there's a famous experiment where where having photons try to try to sort of uh, going going against the Earth's gravity, they will get slightly less energy. They don't go because of the way photons work. Because photons are massless, their speed is always the speed of light. But the energy of a photon can be slightly less as a result of being sort of pulled back by gravity. And similarly, the momentum of a photon, which is which determines the direction it goes in, can be distorted by the pull of gravity. And that's why a photon can be turned. Um, okay, so many questions. Um, Okay, a uh, question from, I'm, I'm looking at the end here from uh, Catalin. Can you build a satellite with off-the-shelf electronics, such as a Raspberry Tri Pi, uh, by, uh, that, that will succeed in space uh, by providing some basic shielding? Okay, so there is a, these days, lots of people uh, fly little satellites. They're things called CubeSats, which are little, little tiny sort of cubes, and you can pay, I forget what it is, I think maybe $10,000 or something is enough to fly a small amount of electronics into Earth orbit, and that price will only come down. And so, uh, yes, you can you can get a um, a small satellite. Um, you can just make it with a radio antenna. You can put a Raspberry Pi on it. There's actually a thing I think it's called Astro Pi, which is a, a project to have a, a sort of a, a space ready version of the Raspberry Pi computer. These are like thirty fifty dollar little tiny computers. Um, and yes, people do that. I mean, unfortunately, it's a it's a tough business because you know your your satellite gets taken up by a big rocket, you know, a SpaceX rocket or something like that. It's in a big rack with lots of other little CubeSats. The rocket gets into orbit, and then it's like, okay, let's throw all these CubeSats out into orbit. So they go out into orbit, and then the first question is, can you find your CubeSat? In other words, you're detecting it from the Earth. It goes around the Earth every ninety minutes, and it's like, oh, can we detect it? Actually, I have a friend who's, who's, um, uh, who, who flew one of these CubeSats, and they lost their CubeSat. So the thing was, was released from a rocket, and they never managed to get radio communication with it. 
And you know, it can be tricky because if the thing is tumbling in space, its radio antenna may not be pointing the direction you think it's pointing in. Uh, you may not, now there's, in all the objects in orbit around the Earth are being tracked by radar. So if you have a metal object, even a bolt that fell off some spacecraft, it produces, um, uh, because it's metal, radar, which is uh, radio waves, uh, will, be, will, uh, will kind of bounce off the, the metal bolt much more intensely than they'll bounce off, uh, the, the, you know, the, otherwise they'll just go off into space. But the radar, radar is you send out a radio pulse and if it, uh, and you see whether something comes back. And so if there's a bolt there, it will come back. And so NORAD, um, North American Air Defense Operation, um, tracks basically everything in orbit. Um, and so, for example, we get a feed from, from NORAD that comes into our Wolfram Alpha system that gives the basically position of every object that's in orbit around the Earth down to the bolts. Um, and uh, actually, Elon Musk, SpaceX company just launched this um, Starlink uh, collection of satellites, and that's what, 300 satellites or something that were launched in the, from this big rack. Um, and those are, those are just, they're all tracked. You can, you can go find where all of them are. Actually, what, what actually happens is um, uh, what NORAD provides us is, is not the instantaneous position of every satellite. They provide a thing called the TLE data, which is, um, it's called two line elements. And what those give is, uh, they say basically uh, what the parameters of the orbit are. So they say, uh, you know, is this thing orbiting around the equator? Is it orbiting around the pole? How fast is it orbiting? How high is it orbiting? Turns out you need to give a certain number of, of mathematical parameters to determine the orbit. And then we just compute based on those, um, those parameters, we compute where the satellite will be at a particular moment when you ask the question. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so the answer is you, you can, you know, you, you can make a basic satellite. Now, I think as you try to get beyond low Earth orbit, I think you're subject to much more radiation. Um, and I think it becomes significantly more difficult. What was typically done, so, so satellites, so electronics that gets flown in satellites, uh, particularly the going, you know, into deep space and so on, uh, you, you end up having to have microprocessors that are arranged so that they're not so subject to, uh, uh, to being destroyed by, by uh, uh, radioactive particles, by cosmic rays and things going through them. Uh, a, a common trick is to have multiple CPUs and to say, oh, you know, we have three CPUs and whatever decision we're going to make about whether the spacecraft fires its thrusters or whether it should return a message to Earth, let's by majority vote. Say if two of the CPUs say do it, then we do it because, gosh, the, you know, some cosmic ray might have gone through one of the CPUs and caused it to produce a goofy answer at that moment. So that's a, that's a kind of common technique. And um, mostly these radiation going through, well, eventually it will destroy electronics, but, but at the beginning, all it's doing is to make the electronics sort of do the wrong computation, come out with the wrong result. Um, but that's, uh, I mean, usually in the, okay, I, I don't know the current story with this, but, but usually there are, when you buy a semi, piece of semi, uh, you know, semiconductor device, there are usually, I, I'm, I'm pretty out of date with this, so don't, don't uh, you go, go look it up if you want to find out the latest. But it used to be the case that you buy a piece of electronics and you would buy some chip and it would have designation, you know, seven, four, something or other. Um, and that first digit was a, a sort of characterization of what kind of a chip was it? Was it an ordinary commercial grade chip or was it a military grade chip? Um, and uh, the military grade chips, I think they had a five designation back in the day. I don't know what's the case now. Those military grade chips were made to withstand, for example, more electromagnetic, you know, some degree of, of uh, uh, sort of electromagnetic pulse and radiation and all these kinds of things. I mean, that was particularly something of relevance during the Cold War and so on. But um, uh, in any case, so th those are on, and, and typically you, you don't get the very latest, fanciest, fastest CPUs are not available in these kind of radiation hardened forms. But I think that's on deep space probes, I think that's what you still have to use. I don't, I don't think there's been a way around that. You can also put shielding around these things, but shielding is heavy. I mean, shielding, if you, if you put, for example, lead, um, lead is, is sort of because it's the, the, the heaviest um, stable element, it, has, um, it, it does the best at stopping charged particles like protons from the sun or something getting through things, but, but it has, um, uh, it's, it, you, you need quite a, uh, you know, for example, we could look it up here. 
for the charged particles from the sun that are, that are the, the most popular today. Let's see, ion temperature is 60,000 kelvins, so we could work out what the energy of those is, and we can work out what, how much thickness of lead you need to be able to shield from that. I, I don't know what the answer will be, but I think it will be, uh, it might be uh, uh, something quite thick, which means it will be quite heavy to use as shielding. Um, yeah, there's a question from Jamie here. What additional shielding technologies do you think will be best to use for space radiation when astronauts head toward Mars? I mean, people have talked about putting big water tanks. You know, it's like if you're going to store water for the trip to Mars, although you typically will have to recycle all of it, but, you know, store that on the exterior of the spacecraft to use that as a, as a piece of shielding. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the... Um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what what the physics of that is? All right, let's take a look. Um, um, uh, let's go back here and, and um, okay. There are a bunch of questions here about um, can you find an element that would make an indestructible spacesuit? There's a question about um, uh, what are the unique properties of element 115. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so. People may probably know about the periodic table. Actually, a good friend of mine, a person who worked at my company for 25 years named Theo Gray, um, uh, has made this very lovely periodic table um, that uh, is up in a very large fraction of, of uh, school chemistry labs. It's a, it's, a, it's a periodic table in which has a, a picture of a sample of pretty much every element in the periodic table. So people know periodic table starts, you know, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, sodium, magnesium, is that right? I don't know, I, I, have, to, I have to look it up, I'm sorry, I don't know my, um, one of my kids memorized pretty much the whole thing, but I'm afraid I'm, 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 uh, 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 I'm, not, um, I'm not that good. Um, but in any case, the, the periodic table lists all these different chemical elements. What are these chemical elements? These chemical elements are distinguished by what is in the nucleus of the atoms that correspond to those elements. So hydrogen is element number one. It has one proton in its nu nucleus. Helium is element number two. It has two protons in its nucleus. Beryllium element, hydrogen, helium, lithium. Lithium is number three, um, has three protons in its nucleus and so on. And so each different kind of element is distinguished by the number of protons it has in its nucleus. Um, and uh, there are also, in addition to protons in the nucleus of the atom, there are also neutrons, and there are different isotopes that correspond to having different numbers of neutrons. So for example, for hydrogen, the most common form of hydrogen is what's often called proteum, which is uh, hydrogen which has one, just a proton as its nucleus. But there's also a thing called deuterium, which is hydrogen that has a proton and a neutron as its nucleus. And so for example, water, H2O, you can have D2O, which is deuterium oxide, where instead of having ordinary, uh, uh, ordinary hydrogen um, and an oxygen, you have hydrogen where the nucleus, we have this different isotope of hydrogen, where the hydrogen is, um, uh, is made from um, uh, a proton and a neutron. And so that makes what's called heavy water, which is important in nuclear reactors because heavy water absorbs many more neutrons, which is an important issue in nuclear reactors, than ordinary water absorbs. So heavy water is, a, is, a, is an important thing to have if you're making nuclear reactors. Now, heavy water occurs, oh boy, I think, I think it's one in 10,000 hydrogen atoms is, uh, uh, has an extra, is that right? Has an extra, has that extra neutron. So it's a, a, the, uh, so in, in naturally, natural abundance of, let's see what it is. I, let me not tell you the wrong thing. The natural abundance of deuterium um, is, uh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, I was right. 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. So about one in 10,000 atoms of hydrogen um, has that different nucleus with an extra neutron in it. Um, and so that's, uh, but by the way, hydrogen has another isotope that's uh, called tritium, which is um, uh, one, um, uh, one proton and two neutrons in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom that makes tritium and tritium has okay so here's a funny story so tritium has 
pretty low abundance on the earth because it's only made, it, it is unstable. I just looked it up. The, um, uh, the half-life of tritium is 12 years. So in 12 years, half, if you have a, a, a bunch of tritium, in 12 years, half of it will have decayed away. So it will decay, um, the, the, the nucleus will, will basically fall apart and uh, will turn into a nucleus of, 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 um, of ordinary hydrogen um, plus some particles will fly off probably, um, uh, I think, um, uh, what is the decay mode? It is a beta emission decay. So, oh, okay. So it, it, it um, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll decay to helium. It'll actually turn into helium plus an electron. Um, one of the neutrons will turn into a proton emitting by emitting an electron. So that happens. So if you have a bottle of tritium, uh, every, every 12 years or so, there'll only be half of it left. And you wait another 12 years, half of that will be left and it will decay exponentially with time. Okay, so how much tritium is there on the earth? Well, tritium is made by uh, those cosmic rays, by, by things, by, by, for example, high energy particles from the sun will make a small amount of tritium when they interact with water on the earth. But actually, when I was a kid, the, um, you know, I remember, I forget the actual number, but, but you know, there's a certain amount of tritium, one, one part in a, in a trillion, let's say, of, 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 uh, of water on the earth had uh, the hydrogen in it was tritium, okay? And uh, if you looked up that number now, the number would be much smaller. So the question is, what on earth changed on the earth, so to speak, between when I was a kid, let's say 50 years ago, and, and now? And the answer is that uh, nuclear explosions, nuclear tests in the atmosphere of the Earth produced enough radioactivity that tritium, they produced tritium that ended up in the oceans of the Earth. And the oceans mix enough that your average little piece of water that you just get from somewhere um, had tritium that was created by those nuclear explosions in it. And that, um, and so, but that tritium that existed when I was a kid has decayed by now. And so there's less tritium around. So if you look in a, in a chemistry book or something and you say, it says, what's the abundance of tritium? You look at a book from the 1960s, it'll give a different value than the book today because the tritium that existed that was produced in the, in the Earth's oceans by those nuclear tests has decayed away. It was actually pretty interesting for people to figure out uh, mixing of ocean water by, by tracing that tritium and things, um, independent of, of uh, the category of bad ideas of, of testing nuclear weapons in the Earth's atmosphere and things, but that's a, that's a different story. Um, it's what you've never tested, you don't know what's going to happen, and uh, uh, it's, um, but in any case. But in any case, so, so back, to, back to this idea of, of, uh, of chemical elements. So, so it turns out most chemical elements are stable in the sense that, you know, you have some gold, uh, which is element number 79, I think. Um, you have some um, uh, tungsten, my favorite element, because its, uh, it's other name is Wolfram. Uh, it has symbol W. Um, that's element number 74. That means it has 74 protons in its nucleus. Um, most of these elements are stable. They last for the whole history of the universe. You'd have a piece of tungsten, it'll stick around for as long as, uh, no nothing will go wrong with its nucleus. Its nucleus will not decay. But other elements decay. And by the time you get to uranium element, well, uh, the time you get beyond uranium, uranium is element number 92, 92 protons in its nucleus. By the time you get beyond uranium, all subsequent elements are unstable. They decay. Typically, their nuclei, uh, one of the things that can happen, well, there, there are a bunch of different ways that nuclei can decay, uh, usually alpha, beta, gamma emission, and nuclear fission. Um, the, um, uh, different nuclei decay in different ways. Okay, so one of the confusing things is that you might say, well, that means when the nucleus gets too big, it'll just fall apart. And so everything bigger than 92 protons will just fall apart. But anything smaller than 92 protons, it'll be just fine. Turns out that's not correct. There are actually two elements, technetium and promethium, that are not so, not so many protons. Technetium has 43 protons in its nucleus. Promethium has uh, 90, 60 protons in its nucleus. If you look in the periodic table, those two elements are not stable. So my friend Theo Gray's periodic table uh, uh, posters, uh, his technetium, well, I don't know what he'll have for, for the picture for technetium, but um, technetium decays um, and so does, so does promethium. 
you know, uh, the origin of, of Teo's um, periodic table uh, picture was at some point, uh, Teo was very instrumental in building the user interface for, for these things called Wolfram Notebooks back in the day. And at some point he kind of finished a lot of that work and he was a little bit bored. And so he sort of developed a hobby and the hobby he developed was he decided to make a periodic table table. So the notion was to have an actual wooden table where underneath each little, you know, it has a bunch of little, little um, uh, boxes in it. And underneath each, each little, little box in the table is the element that corresponds to that position in the periodic table. So he has, um, it's actually at our company, um, it, it's uh, the original periodic table table exists there with, with samples of all these elements. But when we get to elements 43, it's missing because that's a radioactive element. And, uh, uh, and it wouldn't, uh, well, I, I don't know how long, but what the lifetime of technetium is, but we don't really want radioactive elements sitting around in a, in a table in, uh, in the middle of our company. But in case, so, so there are these weird anomalous elements that are unstable. And, and probably the reason for that is um, when you make a, an atomic nucleus, you've got these protons and neutrons, and they're all little balls, basically. And the question is, when you have a certain number of balls and you try and stick them together, um, if you have a certain number of balls, you'll, you'll end up that you can make a very densely packed lump of these balls, but then maybe one of them is, has to stick out just because of the, the structure of, you know, if you have a bunch of spheres and you try and pack them together, um, certain numbers of spheres pack really well and other numbers of spheres don't pack so well. And that may have something to do with why there are some weird elements that are unstable just because with that number of protons and neutrons, there isn't a way to pack them quite as well. It's not very well understood. But in any case, when you get to really heavy elements, um, the in a first approximation uh, beyond 92, they're all unstable. Okay, when I was a kid, people often used to talk about this thing they called the island of stability. People said, maybe when we reach element 115 or 120, maybe we will get elements that are stable again. And they have various arguments for this. Turns out it didn't happen that way. Um, now, I forget what the largest, uh, maybe 116 or something is the, is the heaviest element that's been produced. These elements usually are very unstable and decay extremely quickly. But there's nothing to absolutely be sure that there isn't going to be an element 130 or something that if you ever once made it, it will be stable. Now, the only reason we think that isn't the case is because we think that explosions of stars like supernovas, if it was possible to make those elements, would have made them. Because in those very violent explosions, you're kind of producing, uh, you're trying, having lots of nuclear reactions that will produce lots of kinds of elements. And you would think if it was possible to make that, uh, that kind of element, um, that it would have been made there. I mean, like, for example, all the gold that exists on the Earth was pretty much made in, in supernovas. Well, at least it was made in stars. There are actually two ways it can be made. But, but some part of it was made in supernova explosions of, of old stars that died long before the sun was created. Um, and uh, that's sort of how heavy elements get made. And you might think if there were heavier elements that they would have been made in supernova explosions, but maybe there's a reason they're not. And maybe one day somebody will be able to, uh, you know, there are these uh, so-called heavy ion accelerators where you basically take two atomic nuclei and you smash them together at incredibly high speed. And some of the time they kind of stick and make a, uh, a heavier um, uh, nucleus. Um, and... Uh, uh, maybe somebody will do that one day and they'll make element 140 or something that will turn out to be stable and have all kinds of weird properties. We don't know. Um, there is something that happens. Elements above 137 do very, very weird things. Elements above 137, okay. In, in, so in, in a typical atom, you have the nucleus and you have electrons that are kind of in this cloud around the nucleus. And um, the, uh, as the nucleus, uh, the, the charge of the nucleus attracts electrons to it. They're, they're, that because the electron charge is opposite to the charge of the proton in the nucleus, there's a force of electrical attraction between the, the, um, uh, the, the, the electrons and the, the protons. And that force of attraction, if the, if the uh, charge on the nucleus, if there are more than 137 protons in the nucleus, that force of attraction is so strong that it actually is strong enough that um, it's, it's, there's more energy associated with that attraction than the rest mass of, a, of an electron. Um, and so what that means is you have a bizarre phenomenon called autoionization, where essentially what happens is that um, uh, it is energetically favorable to create electron-positron pairs, electron-anti-electron. You, you make anti-electrons and, and electrons, and you spontaneously produce those 
around this nucleus and that what, what will actually happen presumably is the nucleus will quickly get shielded by this sort of cloud of positrons and electrons and so on around it. But it's a really weird phenomenon where, where you're kind of spontaneously producing particles as a result of the, the, um, uh, the features of the nucleus, or at least that's what's thought to happen. I mean, for people who are interested in the, the um, okay, I'll say the technical thing, the, um, uh, the lowest energy, when you solve the Dirac equation, uh, for the Coulomb potential for, a, for a, uh, a nucleus with Z greater than 137, the, uh, the lowest energy state, um, lowest energy eigenstate for the Dirac equation goes, uh, gets to have less than zero energy. And that's what, that's what produces this, um, uh, this weird effect. Uh, that was probably, uh, sorry, that was, that was just techno speak for, uh, it's sort of interesting to hear what the techno speak for these things is. But anyway, so the answer is we don't know uh, you know, it's very hard to compute the properties of, of like element 115. It's, it decays very, that particular one decays very quickly. But if we could produce, if it turns out that there's a heavier element, a particular isotope of a heavier element that is stable, um, you know, we might be able to, maybe we can produce it somehow. And we, if you ask what kind of chemical properties might it have, the answer is we really don't know very well. It's, it's a hard thing to work out. In the periodic table, one of the ideas of Mendeleev in the original construction of the periodic table is that the, you're arranging the elements in such a way that the so-called periods, the sort of the, the elements that are arranged on top of each other in the periodic table have somehow similar properties. So for example, the noble gases over on the right-hand side that go um, helium, neon, uh, uh, xenon, krypton, francium, I think. Um, those are, those are all gases that, are, that react only very, very little. And they're all the ones that are in the, on, in the, in the right-hand side of the periodic table. And the reason it works that way is uh, when these electrons are, are, uh, there are those are the, uh, the things that have so-called filled shells of electrons. They have all of their electrons are paired up in a certain way. And that makes these, these atoms much less likely to try and react with other atoms. And that's what leads these, those particular elements to have, um, and those are sort of, we know that sort of uh, roughly on the periodic table when we have a filled shell of electrons, then we'll tend to have a, a less chemically reactive substance. So we can make some statements like that, but doing the exact computation is quite hard. Um, and uh, it's, um, I think it's becoming closer. I mean, I think we have, um, uh, actually you can use modern machine learning methods to make, um, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm basis functions for the Schrodinger, for, for, for these wave functions to do a little bit better. Anyway, okay, let, let's look at a couple of other questions and we, we're kind of running into, um, uh, these, are, these are such fun, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, um, there's a question here from Alonzo. Will music again have a place in science as it had in ancient, in ancient Greece? That's an interesting question. So, you know, Music has, a, has certain regularities to it that, for example, uh, when we think about a musical scale, you know, we, um, or, or the, 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 we, we play different musical notes. But we know now from the physics of it that each musical note has a certain frequency. It corresponds to sound waves, which are where you're, where you're vibrating the air at a certain frequency. When you go up an octave, you are doubling the frequency of those vibrations. So for example, middle C is about 256 vibrations per second, 256 Hertz. And the, the next C up, one octave up is twice that, um, that frequency. So, so we know that. And it turns out that our, when we perceive sound in our ears, those, that factor of two, we kind of perceive those notes as being very similar. It's, it's C and it's another C. And, and the reason for that has to do with the actual way that vibrations work inside our inner ears, uh, where the sound is, is, um, is being detected by little tiny hair cells um, on the surface of our, inside our cochlea. And those hair cells are wiggling and they have a, an electrical effect. They, they have essentially a, a um, uh, as, you, as you move the hair cell, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, 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 like a nerve cell that it's like, like, like touch is, uh, is a result of nerve cells that are responsible, that produce a chemical, uh, 
electrochemical effect when you touch them. So similarly, the hair cells in the ear, when, you, when they get wiggled by the sound going into your ear, they produce a, 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 um, an electrical effect that goes through your auditory nerve to your, to your brain, and that's how you perceive the, the sound. But so the way that works physically is such that um, when you double the frequency, it actually doesn't, uh, we perceive that as being sort of a similar kind of note. So there are other things that we know about music, like for example, a, a, a major fifth is a, a, a frequency ratio of three halves. So one and a half times. So C to G is a, is a frequency change of, of one and a half times, at least depending on exactly how you tune your piano or your violin or whatever. Um, but, uh, but roughly that's a, you know, that, so there are these numbers, these frequency ratios. And by the way, those frequency ratios, when you have a stringed instrument, those frequency ratios also turn out to be uh, related to the lengths of the strings that you, when you pluck them, they produce sounds of those, of those frequencies. So, so it turns out that our perception of sound is uh, we really notice these, these sort of numerical uh, ratios in sounds. And um, so that was, you know, the Pythagoreans back in the fifth century BC were, um, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were very big on these kind of the fact that these, these different uh, ratios of lengths of strings would produce, you know, these numerical ratios that, a string that's three halves the length of some other string um, will produce a sound that harmoniously goes with that other sound. That was a that was sort of a big thing, um, and so that that was an early kind of place where mathematics seemed to be relevant to something that we humans were dealing with. The Pythagoreans also believed in some other things that to us would seem completely wacky about the way that mathematics was relevant to to sort of human affairs. And they had this whole scheme of the called the Tetractus, which was this whole scheme about oh I've forgotten it. It was um, oh I don't remember. It was it was a thing where where these different numbers would represent different genders and different this and that and the others. It was it was a it's a pretty wacky scheme to us today. But but their scheme for music was um, uh, uh, you know that works and and it's a it's a way of sort of relating numerical things to to musical things. Now, when it comes to, so that, that's sort of the, the frequencies of musical notes. And we, we understand a certain amount now about why, from the physics of ears and things, about why certain ratios of frequencies are pleasing. For example, there are things called tritones, which are a frequency ratio of square root of two, which is uh, not a, a, a rational number. It's not like three halves or three quarters or something like that. It's a number which you can't write as a ratio of two whole numbers. Um, that frequency ratio is one that is particularly displeasing to us, particularly unpleasing to us. If you play a, a tritone uh, chord, um, it'll be like, oh, that's a terrible sound. And I actually have a theory about why that is, but, but um, uh, to do with the way that it makes some um, uh, sort of, um, uh, well, things called beat notes, which are, which are things we get from combinations of sounds in our ears and in our auditory nerve, uh, that that's I have this sort of theory about why why we don't like hearing those sounds because it kind of confuses the signals on our auditory nerve. But in any case, so they're, they're facts like that. So that's in the structure of of actual sort of structure of music. And, and and you know, in the early days, music was much better developed than, for example, mathematics. You know, when Kepler um, in the uh, in the early 1600s was talking about um, uh, you know the the the, trying to describe the planets and so on. He would talk about the music of the spheres. And actually, if you look at his book, um, he, had, uh, he used musical notation, which was developed around 1000 AD, musical notation of you know, writing notes on a stave and things. That was developed around, I think, uh, 1000, 1068 uh, AD or something. Um, a monk called something, Arezzo, I believe, developed that. Uh, there have been precursors of it, but the, the notation that we have today was developed around that time. So 1000 AD was developed much earlier than mathematical notation was developed. Mathematical notation wasn't developed until, well, really until 1600s was, was when it really took off. And so when Kepler was doing this stuff in the early 1600s, um, his notation, some of his notation was based on, on music, music notation. He actually has these, these musical pieces as part of his uh, description of the planets and so on. So, so, but then mathematical notation took off and that was a much richer way to represent things. Now, when it comes to musical pieces, that's the individual notes. When it comes to a whole musical piece, that's sort of the whole structure of the piece uh, 
has a certain has a certain character to it, has a certain logic to it, and there are there are things you know when you have um, uh, fugues and so on, they have certain structure, and you you can have sort of sequences where there's a piece you know a piece of music that's like a piece of music that's like a piece of music that's like b then it sort of repeats with another a and a b and a b and an a and so on and you have these sort of structural repetitions and so on um so it's interesting to see to what extent those kind of uh structural almost computational uh things are what leads to music being pleasing being boring being whatever actually we had a project back in the around 2007 thing we call wolfram tones which you can go find on the web uh, which uses essentially computational, uh, very simple programs, very simple pro computer programs that were sort of randomly picked. Uh, and these little programs go and make pieces of music. And the way that site works is we try a whole bunch of programs. We might try a thousand little programs. And then we find one where we say, this program kind of reminds us of, uh, I don't know, some jazz music or something. So that's what we produce if you press the button that says, make a piece of jazz music. And it's made sort of at random by, by sampling this computational universe of possible programs. But each of these programs has a certain logic about how it works. And when we hear it, we can kind of detect the fact that, oh, these are not random notes. These are notes that have some kind of logic that determines how they were made. So that's a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting angle there. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of different uh, sort of uh, commonalities between music and mathematics that, that get explored. I think that the, um, uh, in modern machine learning, um, we can kind of learn a bunch about the typical forms that humans find pleasing, and we can potentially knit those together to make a uh, sort of pleasing piece of music. I don't think that's been super successful yet, but it's getting there. Um, there are all kinds of questions you can ask, like the different musical scales, major scales, minor scales, uh, you know, pentatonic scales where you're playing all the, all the, you know, including the black notes and so on. Um, the, uh, um, the things that, um, uh, uh, there are actually, let's see, um, there are 12 semitones and an octave. So there are two to the 11 possible, uh, that's, um, uh, 2048, uh, possible musical scales by picking different notes. Although some of the scales are pretty uninteresting because they involve playing no notes. And so a question you can ask is if you look around the world at different forms of music, what different scales have people used? And the answer is that about 400 kinds of scales that have been used in different, you know, styles of music from, you know, uh, Indonesian to, you know, to, to I don't know, diff different, different, uh, uh, different traditions, musical traditions have used different scales. And about 400 of the 2048 possibilities have been, have been used historically. So that's a sort of a, a type of mathematical thing you can ask about music. Another thing you can start asking is, we have these musical instruments that produce certain patterns of vibration. And we certainly don't know that the patterns of vibration we know so far from different musical instruments are the only ones that might seem pleasing to us. And that's another kind of area of exploration in, in sort of mathematics and music. Um, all right, maybe one more. This is, I'm having such fun, I'm sorry. The, um, uh, um, Boy, we've got a lot of good questions here. I, I, I'm going to have to do this again next week. Um, a lot of interesting questions. Um, uh, there's questions about uh, uh, theology here. We can talk about that. That's interesting. Um, okay, there's a, there's a kind of a meta question here um, from Senkomu. How do I win the fight against fear of learning something if it looks really intimidating? You know, I spent my life learning about different kinds of things. And, you know, every time I'm learning about something, it always is like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to understand this. I'll give you an example. Actually, it played out even today. There's an area of mathematics called category theory, which is one of the most abstract areas of mathematics. And I've been afraid of category theory for a long time. A lot of mathematicians have been afraid of category theory because it's so abstract. It's kind of like you're talking about these things, these morphisms, these functors. You're talking about these very, very elaborate things. And, and in fact, even more than that, there's a thing called higher order category theory, which is even more abstract than whatever. Okay. So finally, I think, Actually, even as of today, I think I really understand higher order category theory in an interesting way. And I understand how it relates to a bunch of things I've been thinking about it. 
how did I get to that point? Okay, so first of all, I read things about category theory and oh my gosh, they're so abstract. I can't understand what's going on. It's like, consider this kind of, you know, uh, com, you know these, these morphisms and this and that and the other. And it's, it's like, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so how do I get into something like that? Well, the answer is I, I find something that I kind of understand and I try to say, or a question that I kind of have really wrapped my brain around. I, I understand the question. Now the issue is, can I use these ideas from category theory to sort of address the question that I have? And, you know, it may take picking away and maybe a little corner of category theory that I use to address that question. Um, it's not the whole thing. It's like when I read the first page of the textbook, it's like it says, consider this really weird thing. And I'm like, I don't know why I should consider that. It seems really, really complicated to me. Um, so, you know, what I've found is if I've got some specific question that can be addressed by this area or that can, I can answer with this area, you bite off a little corner of the area by just thinking about the question you're dealing with. And you don't have to, you don't have to gulp in the whole giant area. You just think about the thing that you just thought was interesting and, and gradually you'll understand more and more about the area. And eventually, you know, you'll, you'll be able, usually what happens with me, I, I try and understand some new area. I'll, I'll get to the point. I usually have, okay, so I'll often talk to people, I'll read things and so on. And, and what I find is at the beginning, it's like, okay, I typically use the strategy I just mentioned of, of, you know, picking a question that I want to answer using that area to get my kind of my way into it, so to speak. And then I'll start trying to understand the whole area. And I'll get to the point where every new thing I read, I like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Every person I talk to, they'll say, well, did you know about this? I said, well, no, I didn't. Um, and so, you know, I, it's very uh, humiliating in a sense at that point, because it's like every person you talk to, everything you read, it's like, oh, that's something new. I didn't understand that. And then for me, with pretty much every area I've ever looked at, there comes this moment when, oh, okay, I more or less get it. And then every new thing I hear, I can fit it into what I already knew. And often I'll say, oh, yeah, I understand that it fits into this and this and this and this and this. It's really a cool feeling, actually, when you get to that point where you, know, you go through this lowest point to me, where I know enough about the area that I can kind of, you know, that I'm sort of taking input about all these different things. And it's like, this is really, this is really scary because I'm, you know, it's like, how many things are there in this area? You know, there's, I just heard about the 20th new thing that I didn't know about. But then suddenly, uh, you know, actually sometimes, uh, that's she's somewhat sudden usually. It, it all starts to fit together and it's like, okay, I get it. I understand all these 20 things. They all make sense. They're all different ways to say some related thing and so on. So, so that's, that's my approach to those kinds of things. I think that the, um, you know, pick off a question that you want to answer and that you, you know, rather than the central approach of, you know, read, you know, start off by trying to understand these definitions. I, I found that very difficult. Um, I mean, another, another trick, okay is there are fields where people, you know, you get into this field and it's like, well, everybody knows all this complicated stuff. And so, you know, you look at books about it and it's like, well, everybody knows these complicated things. And it's like, well, I don't know these complicated things. Actually, they don't seem very intuitive to me. Are they even correct? I might sometimes wonder. What I found is that textbooks written by people who were major figures in these in fields usually have introductions that do a pretty decent job of explaining what the main point is. Um, and that's and often quite elementary textbooks. So even if you're trying to do some quite advanced thing, you know, the elementary textbook, which happens to be written by somebody who really knew that field really, really well, um, will often start with something which is actually gives you a better sort of cognitive map of the field than you'll find if you, you know, if you go to something which is even you know, where, where you think you're getting a much more complete story about the field, you know, going back to that kind of the introduction to the elementary textbook, even though the textbook itself may be utterly incomprehensible, the introduction uh, is, is, uh, will be useful. Anyway, that's a, that's a trick I've, I've um, um, the, uh, uh, let's see. Um, let's see, well, I just, I think I probably should wrap this up. Um, uh, that's a question about how's the theory of everything going? It's going great, really great. I mean, it's just amazing how much stuff 
we're being able to understand from, from existing physics. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question here from MacGyver. Gravity affects photons, but photons have no mass. Is this a case where energy equals mass? Yeah, yeah. gravity has an effect on photons. Actually, it has two effects. There's sort of an, elect, uh, an analog of electricity for gravity where you're just attracting things based on their, um, essentially their energy. And then there's another effect, which is kind of like gravitational magnetism, um, which, is, which affects things that go at a speed and have, um, uh, they have a momentum as well as having an energy. And actually one of Einstein's big predictions um, was that both of those effects would happen for photons being deflected by the sun, leading to a factor of two change in what you might expect, the amount by which a photon will be bent as it goes around the sun. That was a thing that was in 1919 verified, supposedly. Um, the, uh, Um, okay, there's questions here. Um, there's a lot of interesting questions. Okay, we have this for the next time. Asteroid hurling towards the Earth, what can we do about it? That's an interesting question. Um, wow, this is a question. What would I say is a piece of advice for a student starting the LHCB experiment? I am guessing that that is not a young kid. The, um, that is a, an experiment at a giant particle accelerator in, in Switzerland. Well, actually on the Swiss-French border. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question, but, but um, for another time. Uh, all right. Um, I think uh, we should probably, um, it's just a lot of interesting questions here. I'm sorry, I wish, um, uh, wish we had more time. Another, maybe I, you guys are motivating me to, to continue next week. Um, and, uh, well, I hope, hope you find this interesting. And, um, if you're in the U S have a good Memorial day, uh, or elsewhere, good, good weekend. And, um, hope to, uh, uh, to be talking to you again next week. Thanks. Bye.